Hey guys, thank you for tuning in to the Risen Nation Church podcast. I pray that this message today impact your life and above all, draw you into a deeper encounter with Jesus. You guys ready for the word? Are you guys happy this morning? My dad always says, don't stare at me or I'll just stare back at you. So I'm gonna say that. Don't stare at me this morning and look bored because then I'm gonna just sit down and look bored back at you. Amen? And I get bored very easily, so you have to look excited, okay? Does anyone wanna learn this morning? All right. I'm excited about this word this morning, but before we get into that, really quick, um, Isaac, I feel like I'm feeding back a little bit right here. Okay. So we have a couple dates. If you guys wanna write these down. Um, Well, first of all, can we just thank Miss Tamika and all of our volunteers? Can we honor them? And, and Pastor Janine, Pastor Janine and all the teachers, can we honor them? And so we need more volunteers, guys, in a lot of areas. So if this is your house, if you call this, this, um, this house home, especially if your kids are back there being watched by other people every single week, we need to step up and volunteer, amen? amen. All right, so we need facilities, especially Children's Church workers and Coffee Bar. Uh, we're in need of volunteers in those three areas. So see Miss Tamika over here, one of our ushers, and we'll get you guys connected. Okay, couple dates. October 31st is not Halloween. <laughs> October 31st, we're gonna have a fall family fun night. Say amen. amen. And so I wanna make it very clear that I hate Halloween. Just wanna, I, I hate it. Okay. <laughs> So in no way, say in no way. way. Say in zero way. way. In not a way. way. However else you want to say it, we are in no way celebrating Halloween on the 31st. Say amen. amen. But instead of our children having to sit at home bored or have the doorbell ring 48 times, my wife and I shut all the lights and hide under the couch. (laughs) We're going to gather here and we're going to let our children have fun. In a, in a safe, spirit-filled environment, and we're gonna honor God on Halloween, amen? And so, this is not to celebrate Halloween, this is so that our children don't have to feel pressured to celebrate Halloween with their friends. And so, we're gonna, we're gonna set up the back parking lot. Pastors Landry and Whitney, this is their, their idea, so if, if, if something happens, just see them. And the youth and young adults, they're gonna serve the kids, and... Uh, and we're just gonna have a great time. We're gonna have, we're gonna have prizes. And can I say something? Yes. We're gonna let the kids dress up and have fun. Is that okay? Yes. And so please don't be so religious that you think that my daughter in a princess outfit is demonic because I'll slap you in the face. <laughs> All right, just needed to say that. But if your kid shows up like a goblin, we're gonna ask you to go home or change, okay? So no witches, no goblin. We're not celebrating Halloween, but we want our kids to have fun. I said we want to kids our, our kids to have fun. Amen? All right. So that's on the 31st. So do we need to register for that? No? Okay. Just come. It'll be in the back parking lot. That's 6 to 8 p.m. on October 31st. So skip the trick-or-treating and come hang out with us. Amen? All right. October 7th is the last day. That's Tuesday, right? Tomorrow is the last day to vote. So see Miss Carolyn. Where are you, Carolyn? Can we just everyone look at Miss Carolyn back there? Can we just honor her? So she's had, um, she's been in the lobby for weeks helping people register to vote. So if you haven't registered to vote, how many of you know that it's so important to vote? And how many of you know that Jesus is king? Say a yes again. But how many of you know that Jesus isn't on the ballot? (laughs) And Jesus doesn't need to be on the ballot. And so you only have two choices. And not voting is one. I said, you have two choices, not three. And so if, you're, if your choice is, well, I'm not gonna vote, that's a vote. And so we're gonna vote for righteousness. I said, we're gonna vote for righteousness. And I feel that. All right, so see Carolyn um, in the lobby after service if you need help registering or just have any questions. Carolyn is an amazing member of our house. Can we just honor her one more time? And then lastly, I'm super excited. Uh, this Wednesday night, we're gonna have a full band worship night. 
And so at the assembly, we're gonna come. I've asked the whole band to be here and, uh, and we're just gonna enter into worship. We're not gonna have any plans, any agenda, and we're gonna let the Holy Spirit take over, amen? So you guys make sure you're here for that. And I'm also excited my mom will be leading us. So I can't wait for her to be here with us. Um, so make sure you guys are here for that, all right? Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You guys hungry? Yeah. How many of you guys enjoyed Dr. Ben last week? Yeah. That was awesome. They are still uh, traveling. I think they're just kind of making their way back home now, but we, we love them, we honor them. My father and mother are at Habitation Church. Uh, my, my parents ministered there last night with my brother and Emily. How many of you guys pray for our Fort Myers family, for our Nashville family, for our Chicago family? And uh, it's amazing to see what the Lord is doing through them. All right, turn to Deuteronomy chapter one. And how many of you guys have not heard part one of this? And it's okay, I'm not gonna condemn you. Okay. Can we honor the Stevens for coming all the way from Nashville? Yeah. It's good to see you guys. All right, so go to Deuteronomy chapter one. We're gonna do a really quick uh, recap. And this morning, I, I have one goal. How many goals? One. This morning, I have one goal, and, and it, it is that we, we truly come to a new realization, a new place in our thinking, that we, we have our eyes opened to a new reality of how much our Father loves us. Like, I know that sounds simple, and when we talk about the love of God, we think that's like what seeker-friendly churches do, but let me tell you something. There's nothing else but the love of God. <laughs> there, like, there's nothing else to go on to. It's all encompassed in his love. All his character, all his nature, all that he does is based on who he is, and that is love. So I wanna have an encounter with his love this morning. Amen? Amen? Because we can only love him to the degree that we know we are loved by him. I'm gonna say that again. We can only love him to the degree that we know we are loved by him. And so some of us think that he loves us the same way like a distant uncle and aunt would love you, like they say I love you once, once a year at Christmas. But this love... None of us can comprehend this love. And I'm praying, and let me just say this, we don't need to comprehend this love. We need to submit to this love because knowing the love of God is the empowering of God. Children that come from a home full of love that are loved are powerful children. Children that are grown and raised in an environment of love are confident children. Children that don't feel loved are not confident. Children that don't feel loved will always have crutches in their life because everything is based on love. The power we have as sons and daughters of God is based on the love of Jesus for us. And so I'm praying this morning, if we can't receive that love, that God will give us a new heart to receive it. Because we're gonna hear about that. That, well, I don't wanna get ahead of myself, but I wanna have, because I need to teach this, I want to have an experience with the love of God. And if we've made church about anything else, then we need to get back to what is love, and this is the power, the thrusting force of our life. Are you guys with me? And so, with that in mind, I wanna read 1 Corinthians 10, 11. It says, now all these things happened to them, speaking of the Old Testament, as examples, and they were written for our admonition or for our instruction, say instruction, upon whom the ends of the age have come. The Passion says all the tests they endured, all the tests, like think about this, the sovereignty of God, can you guys hear me okay? All the tests they endured on their way through the wilderness are a symbolic picture, an example that provides us with a warning 
so that we can learn through what they experienced. This is how we have to read the Old Testament. For we live in a time when the purpose of all the ages past is now completing its goal within us. Can I, can I read it again? 1 Corinthians 10, 11 in the Passion. All the tests they endured on their way to the wilderness are a symbolic picture, an example that provides us with a warning so that we can learn through what they experience. For we live in a time when the purpose of all the ages past is now completing its goal within us. Say amen. amen. So that being said, what they went through, God is saying here through Paul that what they went through, all the, what they went through in the wilderness, the children of Israel, all the teaching, all the testing, all the humbling, everything they went through was for our example. Like if that doesn't make you feel special and also tremble, I don't know what does. Like God watching, guiding, pillar of fire by night, cloud of smoke by day, guiding them through the wilderness. Everything they went through was just for an example for you. Okay? So I need us to get this reality. And, and this, the passion sums it up so beautifully. And it says, we live in a time which is now, say now, when the purpose of all the ages past is completing its goal within us. And so what was land, a promised land in the Old Testament is a promised life in the new, amen? And so the wilderness, just a couple of, this is just recap, the wilderness is the practice field of the promised land. The wilderness is not punishment. The wilderness is unto perfection. The wilderness is preparation. Some people haven't made it to their promise because they haven't overcome their wilderness. Whom God can't trust in the wilderness, he can't trust in the promise. So does anyone feel like they are currently in a wilderness season or have gone through a wilderness season before? Should be about every hand that is lifted. And you didn't lift your hand, you're lying, it's okay, we'll pray for you at the end. <laughs> Let me just say this also. What I'm talking about wilderness, I'm talking about God-ordained testing in your life or God-ordained trying in your life to make you stronger to make you see him in a way you've never seen him, to make you an overcomer, to make you possess what you don't have. And so this is a God-ordained walk that everyone must do. Now, some Christians, Lord help me, have told me that they're in a wilderness season, and then they tell me why they're in a wilderness season. And I wanna say, this has nothing to do with God. This has to do with your terrible decisions. So don't blame God for your wilderness season when you just make better decisions. You're gonna buy a car you can't afford and a vacation you can't afford. Say something mean to somebody at work and get fired and say you're in a wilderness season because now you can't afford the car and you don't have a job. Are you guys with me? And so this is not what I'm talking about, okay? I'm talking about these God-ordained times in our life that he takes us into the wilderness to speak to us and we learned on Wednesday night that the wilderness comes from the word with dabar in Hebrew, which means to speak. And so God will take you to the wilderness so that all the other things and everything else going on in your, in your life shuts down so you can hear what the Lord is saying. And I believe he is asking us in this season, are we listening? I said, are we listening? And so we are not glorifying hard times or difficult seasons. God's heart for his people, write this down, God's heart for his people is promise. God's heart for his people is abundance. God's heart for his people is joy. God's heart for his people is prosperity. You should be happy, this is really good. God's heart for his people is beauty. He said, I want my priests to look a certain way, to smell a certain way, to wear certain things, to walk a certain way. I want them set apart for glory and for beauty. How do you remember in Exodus, when he's talking about the high priest, he says, I want them set apart for glory and for beauty. And so I wanna encourage you guys because there is sometimes this... Um, 
there are these extremes, right? Like we've heard the extremes in Christianity, like the Ferrari anointing extreme, where it, the, the, there's that group of people that believe like God wants us all to have like Ferraris and you must be in sin or there must be something wrong with you if you don't have a Ferrari. We're not talking about that, right? Then there's the other group that like, if you're not being persecuted, if you're not poor, if you're not broke, if you're not having people chase you with sticks and stones, you are, you're not uh, following after the Lord. Like that, that is the will for his life. And that's not true either, right? So we have to have this balance, but I wanna encourage you guys this morning, and, and I'm just laying a foundation, that God's heart for you is promise. God's heart for you is abundance. And you know what I read when I, I'm, I'm studying this, I'm reading, that God never actually called it, you know, we call it a promised land. He never actually called it the promised land. If you actually read scripture, it says the land that I've promised you, yes, but I believe the title that God gives it is the good land. <laughs> read scripture. God calls it the good land that I've promised you. So he's promised us, and, and we, we, we just heard that the land is a life today. Are you guys with me? God only calls the land a good and a large land. Say good and large. The word good in Hebrew is a good thing. It means beautiful. It is the best thing, bountiful, cheerful. It means to be at ease, to be in favor. This is the will of God for your life. You guys want me to repeat that? Good things, beautiful. And I, I want us to go and study these definitions. And as I'm preaching this morning, don't just, uh, <clears throat> don't just take the information, but take it to heart. And think about the heart of the Father for us as his children, okay? And so he wanted the children of Israel, there's a reason why he didn't take them straight from Egypt into the promised land. There's a reason why there was a, there was this testing season, but the heart of God was that he wanted to give them a good land and a large land. The good is a good thing, beautiful, the best, bountiful, cheerful, to be at ease, to be in favor. It speaks of gladness, joy, pleasant, merry, prosperous, wealthy. I wanna I want say that one again, wealthy, excellent, this is what good land is. This is the life that God wants you to live. And I wanna make no doubt about it. There are people and, and um, uh, different areas of Christianity and different denominations that have, that have take this to the extreme and something that is so pure and we've taken advantage of, of God's merciful heart for us. But I, I wanna make it abundantly clear, like, some of us think, and we talked about this on Wednesday a little bit, but like that, that God's will for your life is to be like Paul or to be like Peter and to suffer for his name. Let me tell you that that will happen automatically. Persecution, because Jesus said they've hated you because they hate me. Like it has nothing to do with you and you don't have to look for it. Like sometimes I feel like we look for it and we feel holier or closer for God if we feel like we're being persecuted and we look for it. Let me tell you, you don't have to look for it. But faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God. So our job is to speak life over ourselves. Our job is to speak life over our children and to understand the heart of God. He wanted God's, God wanted his children that he heard their cry in Egypt, and he says, I have a good life for them. This is good, you guys should look happier. I have a large life for them. Large means roomy in any direction and every direction. It means, it means broad, large. It means freedom and liberty. So I have this good, beautiful, bountiful, favorable, glad, pleasant, prosperous, wealthy, excellent, free life for them. That's my heart for my children. And so know this, that we don't need to pursue persecution or suffering. It's part of being a son that you have to overcome that. But we must pursue the heart of the Father towards us 
that he wants the best things for you. He wants the best for your children. He, whatever situation you are in, God, if it is not the best, he's not done with you. If it's not the best, he's not finished. That he is greater, he is more merciful, he is more gracious, he is more loving than we could ever fathom. And so how good you think your life is, God wants your life to be better. We have to start thinking like this. However much money you have, God wants you to have more. Is that okay? Christians don't like hearing about that. Whatever you feel in your life that is beautiful, bountiful, the favor on your life, God wants to give you more because he's a good father. I never have enough that I could give my children. I will always want to give them more. What, at what point do I say, Chloe and Olivia have too much peace? That's enough peace. They have too much joy. That's enough laughing and having fun. They have too much, well, they have too much toys. That's a different story. But there is nothing that I wouldn't do for them. And if they were, if there is no limit that your father has on what he has given you. There's no limit on what your father has that he wants to give you. And sometimes what we're gonna learn today is we have to change our hearts to receive what he is saying because our old heart can't receive it. So like it'd be like if I went to my wife and said, I, I love you, but she just didn't love me back, which there, where there was a time where she wanted to slap me before we got married. And she just didn't love me back. So I said, okay, you're, that heart can't love me, so I'm gonna give you my heart because I can love myself. Does that make sense? Your heart can't contain the love of God. <laughs> your mind can't contain his wisdom. Your physical body can't contain his glory. You can't contain his goodness. You can't contain how much he wants for you and how much he desires you and how much he loves you. You can't contain it. So he says, I'm gonna give you my mind so you can understand it. And I'm gonna give you my heart so you can contain it. And so it doesn't matter if my children don't understand all that Eric and I do for them. I will continually, continually, continually pour out because my heart overflows with love for them. If there, if there was something I, else I could do for them to show them how much I love them, I would do it. Listen, this is how, I just want us to get a picture of the Father's love. I love all of you, and I love what God is doing in this place, but if God said, go live on a mountain somewhere with your children, that's gonna be the best thing for them, bye. Because my children... And that won't happen in Jesus' name. But my children, <laughs> my children are my life. My wife is my life. And so anything I can do, even at my detriment, my inconvenience, if it hurts me, I mean, we can all relate to this as parents. There were times when Chloe was a baby and we would have like 47 cents in the account. And we would spend every dollar every penny we had making sure that she was okay when we maybe lacked some things. Has anyone ever been there? And so this is the heart of the father that he will give all that he has and he doesn't lack at all. He has more than we could ever think or imagine, but we don't have the space to contain it. And so I pray this morning that God gives us the space, the room, a roomy heart large, broad in every direction, this good and large land. It's not called the promised land. It's a good and large land that he's promised to you. I need your help. It's not called the promised life. It's a good and a large life that he's promised you. You should be happy. And so Jesus wants you to live your best life now. And let me tell you something. He will correct on the way. He will steer. Jesus, take the wheel. What's that lady that sings the song? Carrie Underwood, praise God. 
He will steer, take the wheel along the way. You don't need to worry about that, but he wants, he's not waiting for you to get to a certain place in him that he can begin to bless your life. He pours out everything. I said he pours out everything with what Pastor Landry opened with. He's given us everything that pertains unto life and godliness, that we become partakers of his divine nature, nothing to earn it. We were dead in sin and he quickened us. It was like we were dead, he woke us up and said, hey, come be a part of my life. Hey, come be in my nature. Come have my heart and come have my mind. Everything that I have, I gave my only son for, I have this plan of the ages for, everything that I've worked for and built and have in terms of a natural father, I've given you and you haven't done anything to deserve it. Actually, you've pushed me away and sinned, but I still wanna pour my life and my abundance out on you. What a father we serve. He wants you happy, say happy. Happy. He wants you healthy, say healthy. Healthy. And don't make me say say it, just say it this with me. He wants you wealthy. Wealthy. All right. And this is not a a, a, a hoorah message, please. This is because sometimes as a pastor, I hear not what people say, but how they say it. And this... (laughs) Can I be honest? Sometimes how people talk to me makes me, I was happy before, and then it makes me sad. (laughs) It's a joke. Listen, I know I'm not not, uh, minimizing that we all go through tough times. We've all been there, and we go through difficult situations, but this must be always in the forefront of our mind, that we serve a God that gave everything for us, that we serve a Father who constantly and unendingly, everlastingly pours out for us, that we have everything that we need. And so I say all that to say, our mind needs to shift to this, to this mindset of when things are going, maybe not how we planned, A, what is God speaking to me during this time? And B, I always need to have it on the forefront of my mind that he wants the absolute best for your life now. Say now. That he's not waiting for you to do something, but that we need to live this life and truly believe it. Because when you believe something with this conviction, it, it becomes who you are. When you believe something with this is my whole life, It takes over everything in your life. And so what I said about children, when the children know how loved they are, how precious they are, when they they feel like they are the, the world, the whole world of the parents, it gives them confidence, it gives them peace, it gives them strength. And this is what your father wants for your life, amen? All right, so John 17, 15, just write it down. It says, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world. This is the heart of Jesus, the prayer from Jesus to the Father, but that you should keep them from the evil one. The King James adds the word one, and a lot of translations add this word because we're, we're devil conscious. We need to get rid of this devil consciousness. Say amen. We need to get rid of sin conscious and live the life of Christ. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. And obviously, we wanna stay away from the devil and I'm not saying he's not real. I'm saying he, it does, it, we give him no place. We know that in this house, right? We give him no place, the word says. But the word one there was added. It, it actually, what Jesus actually prayed is, but that you should keep them from evil. The word evil is the Greek word paneros, which means it, it's, not, it's not just hell and the devil and you know horns and a red guy and a pitchfork, Okay. The word evil here, this Greek word paneros that Jesus, well, he would have spoken in Aramaic, but it's translated to this Greek word paneros, which means full of labors, annoyances, hardships, being pressed, harassed. You don't have to write all this down. Toil, calamity, disease, harm, wrong or the uh, wrong or bad condition. So Jesus was saying, keep them from 
laboring. Keep them from these annoyances. Keep them from hardships. This should be opening up a heart of Jesus for you. Keep them from being pressed, harassed, toil. Keep them from calamity. Keep them from disease. Keep them from harm. Keep them from wrong and bad conditions. So he wasn't just saying keep them from the devil. This is revealing the heart of Jesus that he's saying, don't take them out of the world. Keep them in the world, but keep them out of annoyances and hardships. This blessed me when I read it. Keep me out of being harassed and toil and calamity, Lord. Like, it's okay to pray those things. Like, I feel like if sometimes our life is going too good, we're like, well, Paul was in change, so just waiting for it. Like, you don't, need to, you don't need to encourage this. Are you guys with me? He wants that you wanna be in the world, but not of the world, is what he's praying. He's praying that don't take them out of the world, but keep them. He, he doesn't want you in Egypt anymore, but he has his children in Goshen now. Are you guys with me? And so the Lord's Prayer, this is from the mouth of Jesus, both of these scriptures, our Father which art in heaven, we know it, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. When I read that, I heard the Lord say, I care about your daily bread. We forget that he cares about our daily bread. He cares about our debts. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation. Jesus is praying on behalf of his disciples, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us from Paneros. Deliver us from hardship and annoyances and calamity and toil. Deliver us because yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. What he's saying is when we live a life like this, that is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. Okay, we're going somewhere, all right? Second Corinthians, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians 3.3, 3, but the Lord is faithful who will establish you and guard you and keep you from evil, from Paneros. So this is his heart, that he's not just a big God on a big throne in heaven somewhere, but that he's in the details of your life and he cares about your daily bread. He cares about your relationships. He cares about your well-being. He wants you successful. You know, sometimes in real estate, and I'm fighting through this, but sometimes in real estate, a deal will be going so smoothly and so well. How many of you know that in real estate, there's, it's called escrow, there's an escrow time. And so this is a very stressful time for real estate agents. And so there's a time, there's a time of escrow, and meaning that the deal could go, fall through or, the, or we could actually close. So it's always up in the air. There's, but sometimes on the deals that are going so good and I'm just being vulnerable, my natural inclination is, is I'm just waiting for something to screw this up. <laughs> Has anyone ever felt that? Like this is, we're making a lot of money. We're doing well. Like we're, we're, we're killing it. Praise God. What, and then the, that, that, that voice in the back of my mind of what debt's gonna pop up that I forgot about? What bill's gonna come up and take all the money out of my account? What am I gonna, what, what, I, what maintenance thing in my house? What's gonna break? And, and how many of you have, can we just be honest? Have you guys ever dealt with those thoughts? I want those thoughts to be removed this morning because he's called us to an abundant life. I will do exceedingly abundantly above all you can ask or think. So if you're making more money right now than you've ever made in your entire life, there's more. If you're broke right now, there is an abundance that is waiting for you. Can we think like this? We don't like thinking like this because we think it's like, you know, we want to be poor beggars and we think that's holy. I don't know, I don't know what, what you're reading. He, he wants you, him that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. I'm telling you, the Spirit is talking to us this morning. I want to hear what he is saying to him who overcomes doesn't mean that you're gonna live a life of calamity. It doesn't mean you're gonna toil for everything. It means that you're a warrior in the kingdom and the army of heaven. 
And as a warrior, as a soldier, you are supplied with everything you need in abundance. And I wanna go as far as to say like, when, when things don't add up to what I read in scripture, I wanna ask my father, where is that? I'm not seeing this, Lord. Where is the abundance here that you're talking about? Why am I lacking in this area? And maybe he will use that to speak to you on an adjustment we need to make in our life. But his life, his heart is abundance. Amen? All right, that was all free. Now we're gonna get to the message. I'm just, I'm just kidding. Everyone's like, oh no, I'm gonna be here till three o'clock. I'm gonna miss the cowboy game. All right, Deuteronomy chapter one. We're almost done, actually. No one believes that either. I can pick it up, guys. I'm not, I'm not dumb. No, I'm <laughs> Real quickly, Deuteronomy 1, verse 6, it says, The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb, saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Turn and take your journey and go to the mountains of the Amorites, to all the neighboring places in the plain, in the mountains and in the lowland, in the south and on the seacoast, to the land of the Canaanites and to Lebanon, as far as the great river. Verse 8, C, say C. See. I have set the land before you. So we have to see that he has set the life before us. That word set means to give. Say give. give. I, and, and this is review. We learned this on Wednesday, but I want us all to be on the same page. See, I have given you the land. Go in and possess it, the land which I swore to you and your father. So the word possess here means to occupy by driving out previous tenants. It means to inherit to drive out, to expel, to be an heir, or to seize. And so, based on these two verses, we can come to the conclusion that when God gives us something, it's not equal to possession. So given does not necessarily equal possession because he says, I've given it to you, but it's up to you to go and possess it. So he's given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. He's made us partakers of the divine nature. He's given us all these things. He's made us in his image, made us in his likeness. We have the mind of Christ. That's done, sealed, and set for all of eternity. Like I want you guys to understand this. That is not something that God is waiting for you to get. You have that. But there is a possession that is required beyond, the, the, beyond what he has given us where we actually possess what is rightfully ours. And the possession requires a dispossession of everything else that doesn't belong. Yeah. Write that down. The possession requires a dispossession of everything else that doesn't belong. God said through Moses that the children were, will be the ones that possess the land because they have no knowledge of good and evil. In other words, the, the generation that came out of Egypt had too much knowledge. You guys get what I'm saying? They came out of Egypt, they, they experienced too much and they lived their life and made their decisions based on what they experienced, but the children had no experience. And so this promised life is entered by not thinking from a past mindset. This, this promised life is entered and possessed by having a new mind and not thinking and living by memory. So many of us, we, we think we're living a new day every single day, but we're actually reliving an old day over and over again because we live by memory. Being transformed by the renewing of your mind, you'll wake up and everything smells different, tastes different. You'll, logically, you'll think different because your mind has been renewed. And so a lot of Christians say they have a renewed mind, but they actually live by memory. So he's saying to possess this good and large land, you must dispossess. To possess, you must go in and remove that which doesn't belong. There are even good things from our past that we have to remove out of our thinking because God wants to change the way you think so you can possess this good and large land. Verse 19, it says, so we departed from Horb and went through all this great and terrible wilderness which you saw. 
to the mountains of the Amorites as the Lord our God had commanded us. Then we came to Kadesh Barnea, and I said to you, you have come to the mountain of the Amorites, which the Lord our God is giving us. So he's giving it to them. He gave it to them. Verse 21, look, the Lord your God has set the land before you. He's given it to you. Go up and possess it as the Lord God of your fathers has spoken to you. Do not fear or be discouraged. I wanna tell you this morning, you guys remember one thing, do not fear or be discouraged. I said, do not fear or be discouraged. The word wilderness is the Hebrew word midbar, which means a pasture, uninhabited land. It also means speech from the mouth or how you speak. It, also, it, it can mean a desert, but it also means speech. It comes from the Hebrew word dabar, which means to speak, to declare, to converse, command, promise, to warn, to threaten, and to sing. I'm gonna say that again. Speak, declare, converse, command, promise, to warn, threaten, and sing. So the trial, write this down, the trial of the wilderness is, are you listening? The trial of the wilderness is, are you listening? In verse 34, it says, and the Lord heard the sound of your words and was angry. Notice that in Exodus chapter three, God said, I've heard the cry of my children that are in bondage. And then in Deuteronomy, he says, I've heard the sound of your words and was angry and took an oath saying, surely not one of these men of this evil generation will see that good land, there it is, of which I swore to give to your fathers, except Caleb, and then he goes through what Caleb did. Verse 39 says, moreover, your little ones and your children who say, who you say will be victims today have no knowledge of good and evil. They shall go in there and to them will I give it and they shall possess it. That's why you have to come to Jesus as a child. But as for you, he's saying this to the older generation, turn and take your journey into the wilderness into the way of the sea. Then you answered and said to me, we have sinned against the Lord. So the children of Israel now are saying, we've sinned against the Lord. We will go up and fight just as the Lord our God has commanded us. So now they're trying, they're saying, no, sorry, Lord, we, we've sinned, we're ready to fight. Are you guys following me? Yes. And it says, and everyone had girded on his weapons of war and were ready to go up into the mountain. And the Lord said to me, the Lord's saying to Moses, tell them, do not go up and fight for I am not among you. Like, this is, imagine God saying this to you, lest you be defeated before your enemies. So I spoke to you and you would not listen. <laughs> he takes you to the wilderness and asks, are you listening? Because there was more that he was telling them by just his voice. He wanted them to see something about his nature so they could survive the good land. But he had to, he had to change their nature and their heart in the wilderness so they didn't die in the promise. You guys with me? So I spoke to you. He's saying this to the children of Israel. Yet you would not listen, but re rebelled against the command of the Lord and presumptuously went into the mountains. And the Amorites who were in the mountains came against you and chased you as bees and drove you back. Then you returned and wept before the Lord, but the Lord would not listen to your voice. So that when in verse 43, when he says, so I spoke to you, we learned this last week and it's amazing the word that Dr. Ben brought at the time he brought, because he didn't know that some of this was like geared up, ready to go for part two last week. And he's talked about, how many of you remember he talked about what the word obey means? And he talked about that this Hebrew word obey is the word shama in Hebrew. And there's actually, this is the, English translation or the best that the English can do because there's actually no Hebrew word for obey. Remember, he, he, we talked about this last week and there's no English word for shama. And so this word in verse 43 is, so I spoke to you, that's the same word as obey here and you would not listen. I'm sorry, listen is the same word for obey. So God says, I spoke to you, that's dabar, 
yet you would not listen, that's shama, or you would not obey. So the word obey, just write it down quickly, is the word to hear or to listen. There's no Hebrew word for the English, English word obey, and there's no English word for the Hebrew word shama. I remember he went through these three steps, and I wrote them down because I, I think it was so good, and I wanna say it again. But before we obey, we usually go through a three-part process. One, we hear what God says. Two, we evaluate the command based on our understanding. And three, we make a choice to obey based on our evaluation. How many of you remember that? And so the heart behind the word, just to save time, the heart behind the word Shema is hearing hearts. He wants Shema Levot, which is a hearing heart. This is what God was saying when he was saying obey is hearing hearts. Say hearing hearts. And so he's saying, I spoke to you, you didn't hear me, you didn't listen. What does this mean? It means can we hear what the Spirit is saying when our environment is saying something different? You want me to say it again? Can we hear what the Spirit is saying when our environment says something different? Until the time that his word came to pass, speaking of Joseph in Psalms 105, it says, the word of the Lord tested him. So God will give his word to see if you're actually hearing what he is saying. And he will actually, I've, I've, I've experienced this, he will actually, this is what the wilderness is, he will actually put you in a contrary environment to what the word spoken over was to make sure that you have a hearing heart, that you believe what he is saying. This is what it means to obey. A hearing heart is your inner man hearing God above everything else. You guys with me? You want me to say that again? A hearing heart is your inner man hearing God above everything else. And notice that the first enemy they had to defeat was the Amorites, which the word Amorite means to say. So God will speak to you, place you in an environment where there is things being spoken, there are things being said that are contrary to what he spoke over you. God will place you in an environment where there are things in your life that speak a different word, but all I wanna tell you this morning is whose report will you believe? Who are you listening to? So God drew the children of Israel he actually says in, in, uh, in Hosea that he allured them into the wilderness to speak to them. And so no matter what you're going through, can I get help on the keys, Joseph, please? Whatever you are going through, I wanna encourage you that if you feel like you're in a wilderness season, there's, I, I believe that there is something maybe on our hearts that God wants to change. There is something that we believe about ourselves. There is something that we believe about him. And he took the children of Israel out of Egypt like I, I was, the presence of the Lord was just filled my office as I was reading Deuteronomy and Numbers, which doesn't happen that much this week. And the presence of the Lord, because I'm seeing the heart of God, that he calls Moses from a burning bush and says, hey, my people are slaves, and I've heard their cry. And God, from the beginning, has wanted his people. I mean, how many of you know that it's not just only Israelites and Jewish people now. That in Christ we've been grafted in. So when we read about his, his love for Israel and his love for the children of God, that still applies to them, of course, but he's, take it personally, he's speaking about those in Christ. And so the heart of God, he let them out of Egypt, let them wander in the wilderness. He made sure that he tested them, humbled them, he even didn't let his servant Moses go into the promised land. Like even Moses wasn't allowed in there. And God, through the whole story, if you guys read this story of the Exodus, it is God wanting to reveal his heart. If you read the whole thing, and I, I will you guys do that for me? Read the whole thing. Read just throughout all the Pentateuch about how God brought his people out to bring them in. Deuteronomy says, I've brought you out to bring you in. Say that out loud. I've brought you out to bring you in. Some of us are content with God bringing us out because we're not where we were yesterday. 
But I'm here to tell you this morning, he wants to bring you in to something new. There is a good life that God wants to bring you in that's better than your current life. There is a mindset that God wants you to live in that's better than your current mind. There's a heart that God wants you to possess that is better and higher than your current heart. And so God will test, are we hearing them? So God will bring you into the wilderness to speak to you, but he doesn't speak to our ears. He speaks to our heart. This is what it means to obey. Deuteronomy 11, 13 says, and it shall be that if you earnestly obey my commandments, which I command you today, to love the Lord your God and serve him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Psalms 106 says, then they despised the pleasant land, speaking of the good land, the promised land, that they did not believe his word, but they complained in their tents and did not heed the voice. That is the same word, Shema. They did not Shema, the voice of the Lord. So in all that God did for the children of Israel, they still couldn't hear. They still couldn't hear his heart. And I pray today that we can hear the heart of God, that we would be obedient to him. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 30. us to take this personally. We're just going to jump around this chapter real quick. It says, now it shall come to pass when all these things come upon you, the blessing and the curse which I have set before you. So if you read Deuteronomy 28, it'll talk about the blessing and the curse. God gives them two options. Do this. If you obey me, this is what your life will be like. If you disobey me, this is what your life will be like. And Deuteronomy 28 Like I was cringing reading it because the first half of the chapter is about the blessings of obedience. The second half of the chapter is about the curses of obedience. And that chapter is not highlighted or marked in my Bible. The goodness chapter is all highlighted and marked and I never really read the disobedience one. And I read it and it scared me. (laughs) Don't be scared, it's okay. But what it actually did is it And if you actually read that, just read it on your own time. It's the like happiest and saddest chapter in the whole Bible, Deuteronomy 28, because he gives them two choices. He says, I've given you a choice. I've given you a blessing and a curse, and I've put them right in front of you. And the curse is so bad. Like, has anyone ever read the end of that chapter? The curse is like worse than like the Amorites and the Hittites. Like, it's horrible. The thing, I'm like, God, is this, did you really write this? Is this you? And I prayed about like, Lord, why, why is this in there? Like you're, like, you're a God that can present with a curse. And he says, because I've loved them so much that he wants to make the alternative so bad. Are you guys with me? That he doesn't give his children an option. Like it shows the heart of God of like, I wanna make this thing so extreme that if they don't find this land, there's no other life for them. There is one life for the children of God and it's called the good life. Every other life, you are a foreigner and a captive. There is one mindset for the children of God. There's one mind. It's the mind of God. Every other mindset you are captive to, you are a foreigner in, and so it's showing the heart, the extreme, the extreme, intense wrath of God filled with love and wrath at the same time that I need you guys to choose the blessing. This is the heart of God. He's saying, I've given you this choice between a blessing and a curse. And trust me, you don't want the curse. And I need us as Risen Nation to walk in this hard posture of obeying God, the good things he's declared to us, even in the wilderness, even in tough times, that we can believe every word that he has spoken and we have the heart to receive his extreme, intense, crazy love when everything going on in our life contradicts that. So I've set before you a blessing and a curse. 
And you call them to mind among all the nations where the Lord your God drives you and return to the Lord your God and obey his voice according to all that I have commanded you and your children with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse nine says, the Lord your God, if you obey his commandments, will make you abound in all the work of your hands. I'm prophesying. Risen nation, I will make you abound in all the work of your hands, in the fruit of your body, in the increase of your livestock, in the produce of your land for good. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good. This is so good. Take it personally. For he has rejoiced over you for good as he has rejoiced over your fathers. If you obey, if you shama, if your heart hears my heart, hears what I am saying behind what I am saying, to keep his commandments and his statutes which are written in the book, and turn, repent to the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Verse 19, I call heaven and earth as a witness to you today. Risen nation, I call heaven and earth as a witness today against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. <sighs> guys, are you guys with me? I said, therefore, choose life. That both you and your descendants may live, that you may love the Lord your God, that you may obey his voice, that you may cling to him. That word cling means to catch by pursuit. We're never gonna stop pursuing that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days. There's no days without God. There's no days without Jesus. There's no life without clinging to him and catching him by pursuit that you may dwell in the land, in the life that the Lord God swore to you. That you may obey Shama, his voice to cling to him for he is your life and length of your days. To hear God is to love God and to love God is to know how much he loves you. A hearing heart is a heart that is full of love and adoration because when you obey him, when you shama his voice, it causes you to cling to him because you don't just hear the words, you hear the heart. And I want us to hear his heartbeat today. Whoever keeps his word, 1 John 2, 5, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. 1 John 2, 5. You don't have to turn there, I'm just gonna read. So, as we summarize this, what was God wanting them to hear? I want you guys to write it down, and I'm gonna give you the beginning of an answer, but I believe that the Holy Spirit wants to reveal the answer to you in your intimate place. What was God wanting the children of Israel to hear? What does God want us to hear? Not just, like we said, obey based on our knowledge, based on if we conclude this is what the Lord is saying, and based on instruction. But what is he wanting us to hear in our hearts? Verse six, Deuteronomy seven, for you are a holy people to the Lord, your God. This is the heart of the Father from Exodus three when he showed up to Moses. This was his heart for them. And this is his heart always, say always, for you. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. Risen nation, you are a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. We can't just read this from memory. We have to read this and let the word wash us every day. You are a holy people to the Lord your God. He's chosen you as a special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you. This is what he wants us to hear, that he has set his love on you from the very beginning because you were more in number than other people, but he set his love on you because you were the least of all people. 
because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers. The Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. The Lord has redeemed us. Say redeemed us. I don't know if this is like ministering to you, but I felt like this week and last night and Friday as I'm studying this, this is like setting me free because I've known about the love of God here, but I felt like the last couple days he changed me here. And I want us to have an experience with the love of God here because God was not trying to talk to the children of Israel in the wilderness from his mind to their mind. He was trying to speak to him to them from his heart to their heart and their heart couldn't receive it. You are his special treasure. God brings you into the wilderness to speak to you and to tell you who you really are. So why the wilderness? So God can speak to you. So God can show you his heart and obeying is hearing his heart. So the Lord took Israel into the wilderness so they could hear the words, I love you. God sometimes will take you into places and situations and things that are tough just to tell you, I love you. Are you guys with me? Yes. Just to tell you, I'm here with you. Just to, so you feel I am Emmanuel, God, with you. That I will never leave you, never forsake you. Stand to your feet. Here, I believe from the beginning of the Exodus till Nehemiah, Ezra, rebuilding the wall, rebuilding the city, rebuilding the tabernacle, and even that one crumbled. But this is the heart of God that from the beginning has never changed. Jeremiah 31 verse one to three. And I want us to like read this over and over and over again. Can we do that? At the same time, says the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they shall be my people. Thus says the Lord, this is why he took them into the wilderness. The people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. Israel, when I went to give him rest, the Lord has appeared of old to me saying, yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Hosea 2, verse 14 says, behold, I will allure her. That means draw her, entice her, speaking of his people, and bring her into the wilderness to speak comfort to her. Does anyone else have a different perspective of God this morning? This has changed the way I see his heart that like 1 Corinthians says that he would take them all the way through this to be an example for us. And the heart of God the whole time was that they would hear his heart. The heart of God, the desire of God the whole time was that they would see his love. He didn't want them to defeat some Ike just so they could be warriors, but he knew that the prerequisite to possessing and overcoming was to know how much they were loved in the wilderness. He said, I've carried you like a father carries his son. What, how else do I need to show you? I gave you manna from heaven. I gave you so much quail that came out of your nostrils. Your feet and your clothes weren't worn. I've taken care of you. You didn't lack a thing, but you complained and you murmured. And so, I believe in Jesus' mighty name that complaining and murmuring will be eradicated from this house. That complaining and murmuring, you see, God will speak to us. And the way you know your heart has been changed is how you speak back to him. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So he allures us into the wilderness and speaks comfort to us. I love this the word comfort is the word leb in Hebrew, which is heart 
It means of your inner man, your mind. It literally means the beating heart. So he allured them. Look at how amazing our God is. He allured us into difficult times where we may feel like we're in solidarity and loneliness and it may be difficult. And he wants us to, he wants to speak his heart to us. I'm not gonna just speak comfort to her. I'm gonna speak my heart to her and I will give her vineyards from there and the valley of Acre as a door of hope. I'm gonna take their trouble and their disturbance, that's what Acre means, and I'm gonna turn it into a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth, as in the days when she came up from the land of Egypt. And it shall be in that day, say today, today. they shall not, they shall call me my husband and no longer my master. For I will take from her mouth the name of Baals of all other gods and they shall be remembered no more. Everything else you pursue, everything else you've worshiped, you've given your mind to, I'm gonna take it out of your mouth and in that day, I will make a covenant with them, with the beasts of the fields and the birds of the air and all the creeping things. Bow and sword of battle, I will shatter from the earth to make them lie down in safety. This is so good. I will betroth you to me forever. Listen, when we think about all the havoc in the world, the elections and the turmoil and the sin and the wickedness and the wars, he is saying from the beginning and he's still saying now in the midst of it all, I will betroth you to me. I will engage you, marry you to me forever in righteousness and judgment, in loving kindness and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord, and it shall come to pass in that day that I will answer, says the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth. Hello, heavens. He's gonna answer your prayers, and you're gonna be the answer for the earth. And the earth shall answer. The earth is gonna respond to you with grain and new wine and oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who has not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people, and they shall say, you are my God. Somebody say amen. amen. This is the heart of the Father. Ezekiel 36, and I'm done. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land. You're gonna live this life that I gave to your fathers and you shall be my people and I shall be your God. Somebody say amen. amen. This is the heart of the father. This is the heart of God. This is his desire from the beginning that he wasn't saying with an iron fist, obey my commandments or die. He was saying, I'm waiting for someone to hear my heart. I'm waiting for these murmuring, complaining Israelites, these Christians, praise God, that will always murmur and complain and look at their situation and God delivers them from Egypt and they wanna go back to Egypt and Moses had to stand in the gap between the people and God and God wanted to kill them all and start over and Moses is begging him, please God, don't do that. Moses stands in the gap and God actually hears the words of Moses, but God was is so full of love and full of fire and full of passion and he wanted so much for good to, for his children. He wanted them to live a good and large life, but they couldn't hear his heart, so they murmured. And out of the abundance of their murmuring, complaining heart, their mouth spoke. Can I be honest? I say all this to say, sometimes your mouth reveals your heart. And so I pray that this be our wisdom today, that we learn when not to speak and we learn the right words to say. And if we don't have right words that are, if we, if we feel like we're gonna complain, the Holy Spirit and the enemy hears the words you say. We catch the attention of devils when we complain. Complaining is a pandemic a epidemic in the church of God today. And God says, these children of mine, I've done everything for them. I've poured out my life for them. 
I got this crazy guy, Moses, to lead them. I've done all these miracles for them, and they still couldn't hear my heart for them, how much I love them and desire them and wanna be married to them. So you know what I'm gonna do? And he says it through Ezekiel, is I'm gonna give them a heart that hears me. Come on, lift your hands. I'm gonna give them, their heart can't contain this glory. Their heart can't contain this wisdom and this power and this love and this mercy. So I'm gonna give them a new heart and I'm gonna wait for that heart to speak. So Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, give us a new heart this morning. Lord, we ask that you forgive us that we've complained and murmured in difficult seasons, in difficult times, Father. Thank you, Lord, that in no matter what season we're in, no matter what the circumstance, no matter what the environment, Father, that we would learn how to shut everything off and listen to what you are speaking to us. Continue to speak to us, I pray. Father, in Jesus' name, we are listening. If our heart can't contain what you want to say, give us a new heart. Raise up an obedient people that hear your heart, not just your voice, but hear your heart, Jesus, I pray today. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, let complaining be eradicated from this church. Let murmuring be eradicated from our hearts. I pray, Lord, that you would change our hearts, remove our heart of stone, give us a heart of flesh today in the mighty name of Jesus, that when we opened our mouth, it will be the redeemed of the Lord saying so in Jesus' mighty name, that we will speak life over our family. Come on, two more minutes. Father, in Jesus' name, I declare life over Risen Nation. I declare life over our family. I declare health over our children. I declare wealth over businesses. I declare those that are old and thinking this is the last road, I declare strength like you've never known. I declare life and peace and abundance, God, in Jesus' mighty name. I rebuke toil and calamity. Father, I rebuke annoyances and hardships in Jesus' mighty name. As Jesus prayed, God, I pray that you not take us out of this world, but you keep us from evil, God. I pray in the mighty name of Jesus that this people would hear your heart this morning for them, that they are not borrowers, but they are lenders. They are not those that have been overcome, but they are overcomers. They are not defeated, but they are victorious. I pray in Jesus' mighty name that you make them the richest of the rich, the healthiest of the healthy God, the strongest of the strong, Lord. I pray in Jesus' name that our children would break, brown, would break boundaries, God, that we couldn't break, that our children's generation, God, would live a life that we could only imagine, Lord, that it would only increase, Father. I thank you, Lord, that children would operate in the prophetic even at a young age, that they would lay hands on each other and they will recover in Jesus' mighty name. Give us a believing generation that has your heart, that believes your words, that obeys your commandments, God. Change our hearts, change our minds. Let us see your heart the way you see us. Let us see ourselves the way you see us. In Jesus' mighty name, I declare peace and strength. I declare life. And we commit as a house to cling to you, God to never let you go because you are our life and our length of days. Thank you for new hearts, new minds, new bodies. Change our heart and thus change the way we speak that your kingdom may come, that your name may be glorified, that these people may live the good and large life that you've called us to live. In Jesus' name. Everybody said amen. Can we bless God? Come on. Thank you again for joining us for this podcast. We pray that above all, your life was touched by his presence. If you're interested in learning more about the church or getting plugged in, you can visit us at www.risennation.org or follow us on social media to stay up to date with all that God is doing here. We love you guys. God bless.